Hello again, ladies and gentlemen out there in internet land. Welcome back to GIT335 Computer Systems Technology. Once again, I am your instructor, Nick Lindquist, and today we are going to discuss more about hardware. Specifically today, we will be talking about input and output devices. Our topics will include input hardware and output hardware. Input hardware, as we've already discussed, is hardware, and as we said, hardware is anything you can touch. Um, input hardware includes keyboards, other pointing devices, such as a mouse or the stylus, uh, anything that sends a signal uh, into your computer. Uh, we're also going to talk about the future of input devices, which is a very, very, very interesting subject. Um, we'll get to that shortly. And uh, unit B is output hardware. So output hardware is anything that takes a signal out of your computer, such as this monitor is an output device because uh, it displays the output of your computer in a graphical format that you can um, see and interact with. So we say here that uh, soft copy involves display screens. It doesn't feel very soft to me, uh, but in that it's not printed, it is soft copy and not hard copy. Anything that's printed is hard copy. And then we have mixed output, which includes sound, voice, and or video. We're also going to look at the future of output and we're going to consider quality of life, health, and ergonomic issues. So as we have said, input hardware takes a signal from you, the computer user, and inputs it into zeros and ones into a form that your computer can understand. As we have already said, your computer can only understand zeros and ones, and so a piece of input hardware serves as an ombudsperson that interprets uh, your intentions into zero and ones, and then your computer can understand uh, what you're trying to tell it. Uh, and then we say here, output, output hardware is the exact same. Um, your computer responding to you saying, here is the result of the processing you requested, master. Is there anything else? I will eagerly, eagerly await future instructions. Uh, so as we said, uh, printer and uh, monitor are the two big ones. But computer speakers, many, many things can be output devices. So back to input hardware, the three major types of input hardware are keyboards, pointing devices, such as mice, and source data entry devices. And uh, there can be a lot of different types of those. As we see here, that is a uh, scanner in the picture. Uh, so here is a lovely little graphic talking about some of the various input and output devices. Uh, we have input, light pen, or a touchscreen is one that you don't um, commonly think of. Um, the, the digitizer touchscreen on your iPhone uh, would count as an input device, and uh, your finger could even count as an input device. Uh, so we see here that we have webcams, uh, video cameras are obvious input devices, uh, scanner uh, with different types of scanning technology listed there, keyboard, mouse, microphone, digital pen, it went a digitizing tablet, uh, one of those uh, Wacom devices, maybe you've seen it. In fact, this monitor that I have in front of me uh, is a, um, a monitorized uh, Wacom tablet in that you can draw all over it, which I uh, won't demonstrate at this time. But the monitor itself is a combination input and output device. The future is here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so then also we have over here um, a display adapter card, and that particular device is a PCI display adapter card, which would be woefully uh, inadequate and out of date. Uh, and then we have a sound card, which also has the PCI interface. Um, same thing, so this might be kind of an old graphic. In fact, that computer looks like an ancient, archaic Dell Optiplex, the kind of computer that should probably be taken out back and shot at this point. So perhaps this graphic should be updated. Uh, and then we have some other, uh, as you can see, uh, expansion cards here. Uh, this must be a printer expansion card um, and a keyboard input card. I can't imagine that that wouldn't just be attached to the motherboard, but uh, uh, for the purposes of this slide. Moving on, so let's talk about keyboards in more depth. A keyboard converts letters, numbers, and characters into electrical signals, uh, electrical impulses, positive and negative electrical impulses that your computer can understand. So English keyboards work differently from foreign language keyboards. Can you imagine that? Uh, how keyboards work, um, so there's a continu continual uh, electrical signal um, going from your keyboard into your computer. And when that signal is broken, which is what happens when you press a key, the computer says, well, hey, signal's broken. What's going on? What, what's the purpose of this intrusion? Um, and so this interrupts the flow uh, through the circuit. 
um, the processor determines exactly where that uh, break in the circuit occurred, uh, and then it compares um, the character map to determine which key was pressed, and then that character is stored in the keyboard memory, and it actually executes some kind of change in your computer, such as typing the letter K. Uh, so here we are continued. The character is sent to the PC as a data stream via wire or wireless connection, depending on the type of keyboard that you happen to be using. Hopefully uh, you're one of those lucky guys or girls who gets to use a wireless keyboard. No more cables for you, right? Um, moving on here. So most keyboards, and I imagine the keyboard you're sitting in front of right now, is QWERTY. Uh, and this is um, called QWERTY because if you look, the top six letters there are Q-W-E-R-T-Y. So that is a QWERTY keyboard. Uh, however, there is also a more intuitive and some would say much more usable uh, format of keyboard. And this is called Dvorak. Uh, and I'll show you an image of the Dvorak keyboard over here. And the reason it's considered more intuitive by hardcore users is because the letters that are most used are placed next to um, your fingers so that you can reach them more easily without any wasted uh, finger leaping time. So that's what's known as a Dvorak keyboard and you can actually purchase those should, the, um, should that sound interesting to you. However, I would bet that 99.9% .9 of us use QWERTY keyboards. There can be either 104 or 108 keys uh, on your standard keyboard. If your keyboard is old, it could be missing some keys, so you might fall beneath that 104 number. Uh, on a laptop, which obviously has a um, condensed keyboard, there will be between 80 and 85 keys. So uh, it might be kind of, uh, no duh, but a wired uh, keyboard is connected to your computer via a wire uh, through a serial or a USB port. Uh, a serial uh, port for a PC was uh, known as uh, PS2. And I believe the color for that one is green. Or maybe, no, actually it's purple. So if you have those weird ports on the back of your computer, maybe you've seen them. The keyboard uh, PS2 port is purple, and then the mouse PS2 port is green. Uh, so a serial and a USB port on your computer are actually the same thing, except that a USB is a much faster version of serial port. So a serial port is uh, USB. It, it serves the same purpose as USB for sending data into or out of your computer. Only serial is much older and it only sends data in one direction at a time. As we talked about before, there's that old, um, uh, the old bridge uh, out in the wilderness where traffic can only go in one direction at a time and then that traffic has to stop so the people in the other direction can go. So that's a serial connection and USB is obviously much faster than that. Um, printers used to use parallel connections before the days of USB and parallel uh, is two serial, one in uh, either direction at a time. But that's not really what we're talking about right now. Uh, so wireless technology, if you do have one of those wireless keyboards, uh, can use IR, infrared technology, or RF, radio frequency technology. And it doesn't mention this here, but I would like to. Um, Bluetooth keyboards are also wireless keyboards. My, um, Macintosh does not, uh, Apple does not make wireless keyboards anymore. They make Bluetooth keyboards. Uh, Bluetooth is a, a similar technology to wireless. Uh, maybe you've wondered what the difference is. Um, Bluetooth is much more effective and easier to pair. However, it is only good for up to 30 feet. So if you are within 30 feet, Bluetooth is a better choice for connecting. But if you're further than 30 feet away, wireless is your only choice. Different types of terminals. Uh, so these are kind of interesting. We have dumb and intelligent terminals. I suppose that's not very PC to identify them thusly. Um, but uh, there you have it. So a dumb terminal does nothing but display output to you. Um, and these are actually kind of an interesting technology because in the computing commons over here at Polytechnic, we experimented with something called virtual desktop uh, interface. And what that is is the um, operating system of the computer is installed on a network server. So the computer turns on and it has no mind of its own. It just gets on the internet and it says, what am I, what am I doing? And then the operating system flows through the internet uh, and then appears on this dumb terminal, basically. So then you interact with a virtual version of the operating system that's on the network and the computer in front of you is just a very a dumb terminal. However, uh, due to uh, network uh, latency, um, slowness in the network, uh, that was done away with. However, you can be sure that in the future, 
that will be a technology. Uh, I predict that that will be the case because installing an operating system on a hard drive is kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, and then you have to store all your applications on that hard drive where it's much easier to have a virtual operating system with all of those applications installed onto that virtual operating system and then a whole row of computers that all boot up and use that same thing rather than installing Windows on six, seven, eight different computers, installing the applications on six, uh, seven, eight different computers, and then having hard drive failures and all those other things to worry about. Uh, virtual desktops will be definitely a thing in the years to come. So that's a dumb terminal. Uh, an intelligent terminal is one that has been to college. I know, I'm not very funny. My wife tells me every day that I'm not funny. So an intelligent terminal um, actually can do some computing. Pointing devices. So a pointing device, uh, as we said, is part of the graphical user interface, or GUI. There is no pointing device uh, on a command line interface. A uh, command line interface is text-based only, and the purpose of a graphical user interface is to take the position of the cursor or pointing device, and when you click, it translates that into text-based commands that the computer will understand. So here we talk a little bit about the, the mouse, the principal pointing device, until we get to the whole wub wub thing that uh, inevitably I think we'll probably be getting there. Um, and actually, uh, maybe you've seen those uh, trackpads. Uh, no, not trackpads, what are those called? The, um, the touchpads, the really, really, um, the neat ones that uh, Apple has that you can interact just by touching the pad, that's pretty slick. I like that. Uh, those are on MacBook Pros and whatnot, and you can also get them externally. Uh, and then there's also, obviously, the way that we interact with our iPhones and iPads. Maybe not our Android devices, because those suck. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not actually the case. They're great, too. Uh, so anyway, mice are still extremely relevant and extremely used, but I would predict that they probably won't be forever. I like to do digital painting. Um, I'm not necessarily good at it, but I do enjoy it and a mouse is just not an acceptable input device for digital painting. So I use the stylus, as I said before, that you can grip as a paintbrush to get those details, whatever it may be. But anyway, so I don't mean to bag on the mouse too much. We are talking about mice here. Uh, and here's some, we can have a mechanical mouse that has the balls uh, inside, of the, uh, inside of the mouse, that, and it feels it uh, rolling around, and then it determines how far it's rolled and where its position should be on the screen. When I was a young pup and I had computer class, um, the smart aleck kids, not myself, I was a really, really good student and I never goofed around. But the smart aleck kids would take all the balls out of the mice and then the balls would disappear and nobody could use the mice. But that was very, very funny in junior high. Uh, and then an optical mouse uses laser beams and special chips to ascertain where it is and where it has moved to and then translate that into position data information to interact with the graphical user interface. More about pointing devices, uh, a trackball, you've probably seen these. This adorable little Apple mouse, as you can see, has a trackball. Just a tiny little nub here. And then on the back, as you can also see, uh, it is an um, optical mouse, and it has that little laser as we were just describing. Uh, the touchpad, as you can see, here's a MacBook Pro, um, and the person is interacting with that um, touchpad, as I was just saying. Now the pointing stick, Doubtless you've had um, experiences with these too on laptops. Um, I would used to call them the little nubs, and I didn't really particularly care for them, especially for gaming. Um, but uh, that's called a pointing stick, that little nub that you interact with with one finger. Uh, more pointing devices, touch screens, and we actually touched on those. Um, Multi-touch screens that recognize two or three. So um, on a Mac trackpad, um, you click with one finger or two, uh, would be a right click, and then there's other things that you can do um, to assign different functions to different uh, hand motions and um, points of contact. Uh, so that's a multi-touch screen it recognizes being touched in more than one place at a time. And then a pin of input, which once again, we have our fancy stylus. So here are some other perhaps more interesting uh, and specialized input devices, scanners and reading machines. So a scanner converts a physical piece of paper, or whatever it may be, uh, into a, a bunch of collection of zeros and ones that the computer can understand, one pixel at a time. And so the higher the resolution of the, that scan that you make, the more pixel data there is describing the image. And so the higher quality um, it is, or the, the higher the resolution, uh, the bigger the image file, and the better it looks also, because the more pixel data that you have, 
uh, the better the image looks, as I'm sure you can well imagine. So if you have uh, a grid of 100 by 100 pixels, um, I suppose you would have 1,000 pixels there. But if you had a grid of 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, taking up the same amount of space, well, you can imagine how much more rich um, uh, and detailed that image would be. So higher resolution is good. Uh, it used to be that all computer screens, or maybe not all of them, but um, they started as, I suppose, with GUIs uh, 800 by 600, and then we have 1024 by 768, which is still valid. And then they go all the way up to like 2560 by, I forget, maybe 1920 or something like that. That is a lot of pixels. And those do um, high resolution MacBook Pros or the high resolution iPads. Um, what that means is they cram more pixels onto the screen to create a more rich depth um, of color. So those are scanners. Um, barcode readers are also perhaps uh, an older technology, but still a very, very effective technology. So obviously it still continues to be used. Um, barcode readers are um, in use everywhere. Um, so uh, special software encodes the meaning into the intended meaning into the barcode, and then the barcode is then printed out so that the scanning device, the barcode reader, uh, recognizes what is encoded into that barcode and the intended um, message is input into the computer. Uh, so, as you can see down here, we have a 2D barcode and a, a newer twist on that is QR codes. Maybe you've seen those. In fact, I have no doubt that you've seen those at this point. Uh, there's actually a cool website. There's many cool websites that you can go to create your own QR codes and then you can create one of those cool little squares with the, uh, it looks rather like the 2D barcode, and then you download a free um, QR reader app on your smartphone that uses the camera to take a picture of that uh, QR code, and then it will take you to the, immediately to that URL that's uh, encoded into that, UR, or that QR code. Uh, so as you may have seen in my email signature, I put my schedule in a QR code, so if you were to whip out your cell phone and take a picture of that, you would see it would take you to the Google document, the Google Calendar, in which I have all of my, um, so that you can see what I'm up to. Um, so QR codes are awesome, and they're going to become more and more and more, more and more and more and more widely used as people begin to embrace the technology. Personally, I think it would help if they had a uh, more memorable, sexier name than QR codes, but uh, what do I know? RFID tags are also very um, interesting technology. Uh, RFID is used to, uh, if you go to Dillard's for instance, there's a little RFID chips in the clothes so that they know if they are leaving the premises or if you walk through those, those tall uh, whatnots on either side and the RFID chip has been um, not been deactivated, uh, then you'll trigger that alarm. Many of you shoplifters um, will know that feeling. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but those have to be deactivated, and that's what the salesperson is doing when they rub them over that deactivation thing. Uh, so then we say here, active RFID contain their own power source, and passive RFID tags do not have any power, and they must be read by some sort of a scanner. So I find conspiracy theories interesting. I don't believe everything I read. In fact, I believe very, very little of what I read. But they're interesting to mull over. And one of the classic conspiracy theories is that uh, the ultimate goal is to get all of us fitted with RFID chips so that Big Brother will know where we are at all times and that you can't really escape from uh, the machine. Which is uh, kind of funny because now we have smartphones in our pockets at all times. And uh, so we've actually basically RFID'd ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. It's interesting, um, my boss was showing me that uh, he uses some kind of Google plugin that keeps track of everywhere he goes throughout the day uh, and then shows him on a map where he's been. And then you can look at throughout the course of a month, a week, a year, whatever it may be, and it'll show you exactly where you went over the course of that month, which is to me a little bit scary. Um, just a little bit scary. Uh, one of my students was showing me his smartphone how proud he was that uh, the microphone is always on listening to commands. So for him to say, um, I don't know, call mom, you know, whatever, the smartphone would immediately hear that and then do it. But it's a little bit creepy to me to have the microphone on all the times. You know, that's just a little bit awkward. Uh, and then so he was also saying that the camera looks for his face always. And when it sees his face, it wakes up. But it's also a little bit awkward for me to have the camera on all the time also. I don't know. It's kind of a weird dystopian type of future that we're living in right now. Uh, there's a concept called the panopticon, which is you cannot escape. Everything you do is seen. Um, 
prisons have panopticon systems and where they see everything that is done in all the different places. And it seems to me that the whole world is one giant panopticon now. Anyway, moving forward, um, mark recognition readers, magnetic uh, ink character recognition, as you can see, is on the check here. OMR, optical mark recognition, such as on Scantron devices. And OCR, optical character recognition, perhaps the one that I find the most interesting. Uh, that is, OCR technology is used um, for, in the case of scanning old books, digitizing old books. Uh, uh, a whole page of perhaps uh, old English text or something like that can be uh, scanned by OCR and those letters can be recognized and digitized. Interestingly enough, you've probably come across those CAPTCHAs um, and recaptchas, and what actually that is, is words that the computer cannot recognize. So not only are you proving that you're a human being, but you're also helping out all of us by uh, telling the computer what that unreadable word is. Uh, and then there's an algorithm in that it asks you two words, one that it knows the meaning of and one that it does not, and it assumes that if you get the first one right that you also are telling the truth about the second one. So interesting. <clears throat> okay, more about input capture devices, digital cameras. I'm sure you're well aware of, of what those are and how those work. Uh, webcams are similar, um, but obviously the resolution is much, much lower. Um, they can act for the most part via USB. Uh, here's more about digital cameras. Uh, audio input devices, um, such as microphones, obviously. Uh, most, I would say, commonly used audio input devices these days uh, interface through USB. Uh, but if you have one of these, as you can see over here, a condenser microphone, uh, it needs to be digitized because that audio signal will be analog. So the soundboard, as you can see here, is an add-in in a computer that will convert analog sound to digital sound. Uh, and then MIDI, M-I-D-E, is a very old format for inputting um, musical instruments, uh, digitizing the sounds made from musical instruments. So you would need a MIDI interface to do the whatever on your bass guitar, uh, getting it into your computer to get that wicked, slow, rambling bass line um, into your computer. Speech recognition, speech recognition systems, such as uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking, is the industry standard for that. Uh, it basically, it comes to recognize more and more what you speak. Um, it gets more and more familiar with your own voice. And nowadays, uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking says that it's 99% effective, which is to say that it only bungles about one of a hundred words, and you'll have to go through, of course. Of course, you're going to check the work of the software, as you always should, but only one out of every 100 um, words is bungled. I have to tell you um, how very, very impressed I am with the uh, speech recognition uh, in my smartphone. Uh, it's the words that I would never expect it to actually get. As I do say some very strange words, it does recognize them um, when I talk to text. In fact, when I have to write short articles for whatever reason, rather than sit down at a computer and go through that whole rigmarole, you can just speak it one line at a time and then copy paste that into an email and send off your article, um, which is what I do. And it's actually so smart that it recognizes it'll actually go into my address book and then it'll find a name, you know. One of my coworkers is named Shaheen. And the first time it recognized, it uh, came back with shouldn't instead of Shaheen. Uh, but then I corrected that to Shaheen and it was actually smart enough to uh, start uh, recognizing that as Shaheen instead of shouldn't. Uh, anyway, sensors, um, there's all sorts of different sensors. They collect environmental data, uh, what's going on in the world around um, that particular sensor and then input it into the computer. Uh, the sensor that you would be most aware of, without a doubt, would be a smoke detector. Uh, it recognizes the presence of smoke and then sends a signal to activate that high frequency, extremely loud and irritating sound that will hopefully get you up from your bed and out of the house. Or to let you know that you are burning something on the stove and that you should get up and see what the heck you're doing. Uh, biometric input devices, these are becoming more and more and more and more and more prevalent because um, they may or may not be, in fact, they, well, they definitely are, uh, but they're not perfect either. They are more secure um, over the, um, the traditional password method in that passwords are becoming easier and easier to crack uh, for computers. Uh, even if you make a very, very, very long, complicated string, um, the brute force um, password cracking software, um, the faster computers are, the faster they can try every possible combination and eventually crack your password. However, it's much, much diff more difficult to fake your, um, your fingerprint, uh, for instance. Uh, maybe you've seen 
Um, my wife and I were watching, what is that show? Um, Blacklist. It's a rather violent, so I wouldn't recommend it um, for everybody. Uh, but it was pretty neat, so they wound up cutting off some guy's hand because uh, they needed to input the specific uh, finger um, and to access some kind of computer system. And it was grisly and gross, but at the same time it was an excellent um, example of biometric identification. So I'm realizing I'm sounding like quite the Apple fanboy, and that's not really the case. I recognize that PCs are equally good, and I'm joking that Android is not equally good. They're just, they're just different. Anyone who says that one is better than the other really is a fanboy. Uh, and that's not me. I recognize that they're different and each powerful in their own way. But I got to tell you that I'm really impressed with the feature on my iPhone where um, the home button is sensitive to this little finger and it's identified my fingerprint and then boop, so I can do that too. To purchase things, to unlock the phone, and to prove um, that I am myself. So as you can see, this technology is really starting to take off and uh, we're going to be seeing a lot more of it going forward. The future of input. So this is a very, very interesting subject uh, in that, well, the one that I find most specifically interesting is uh, the brainwave input devices. I've seen an example now uh, in someone who is completely paralyzed, um, but by attaching a, a chip to his brain, it picked up on the electrical impulses in his brain and he was able to maneuver a mouse pointer um, around the screen and click and do all those other things by thinking about it. One would say, I would say that that is a little creepy, but at the same time, very cool. Uh, if you think about it, if you try to extrapolate, well, where will that technology be in the next 10 or 20 years? Yikes. Yikes. But for the time being, um, and helping um, uh, paraplegics, quadriplegics, whatever it may be, or anybody um, with any sort of a disability to access computer services, that is pretty awesome. Uh, and now, output hardware. Output hardware, as we said, can be soft copy or hard copy. Uh, soft copy is displayed on a screen, hard copy is printed out. Soft copy output, we talked a little bit about screen size and aspect ratio. Um, the, asp the active display area is the size of a computer measured diagonally, and this is the same thing as a television. If um, you've ever wondered like uh, how big a uh, 27-inch TV is, it's measured diagonally from one corner to the other corner, and that is the size. And it's the same with computer monitors. Now the aspect ratio is, it has to do with how many pixels are on the screen. So the old format, the old standard is 4 by 3, which would be uh, 60 by 80 pixels, I suppose, or 800 by 600, um, as I said, was the original size. Uh, so, but now we have HD which is an aspect ratio of 16 by 9. And so videos that are shot, movies that are shot in 16 by 9, if they want to go back to standard definition, so if you watch or purchase um, a movie that was shot in high definition, uh, you should always choose to watch it in high definition. Sometimes you're given the option, because should you choose to watch it in standard definition, the, um, the standard definition version has been what they call panned and scanned, because obviously, uh, 3x4 cannot fit all that data on the screen at once. So you're not seeing everything that was originally shot. You're seeing pieces of it, and then they move it around to capture the most useful parts of the screen at any time, but you're not seeing the entire film. So whenever possible, you should watch a high-definition film. In high definition, you owe it to yourself to do that. Uh, screen clarity, uh, we talked about um, dot pitch and resolution. It refers to the number of pixels per inch uh, and obviously the more pixels you have, the higher the resolution is. Uh, screen clarity has to do with the number of colors that are used um, to display that image. Uh, as you can see, 8-bit has only 256, that magic number 256 that we talked about, whereas 24-bit has over 16 million. So you can guess there uh, which would render the higher uh, quality visual image. Now the refresh rate is, so uh, when pixels are displayed on a screen, they're burr, 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 shot on there one line at a time, the specific um, color uh, in each pixel, and the refresh rate is how often it goes all the way through and then starts up again at the top. Uh, so because the refresh rate uh, in video and the refresh rate for a computer monitor is different, maybe you've seen uh, when a video camera will shoot and then there will be a computer monitor in the background. You'll see a weird black bar that goes That's because the refresh rates are different. 
so that maybe help, will help you understand um, exactly how the refresh rate works. And those are usually in um, numbers like 55 hertz or 60 hertz or something like that are common refresh rates. So here we talk about graphics cards a little bit. And if you're a gamer, graphics cards are very, very interesting. Um, maybe if you're not a gamer, they're interesting too. But they'll be more interesting to you if you are a gamer. So graphics cards these days have basically just completely blown up. Um, so the one that you see here in the picture is probably has uh, 256 or at the, at the very most, maybe 512 um, megabytes of VRAM, which is like regular RAM except it contains, the V is for video. So it contains exclusively video information. And as you can see down here, uh, so a faster video card obviously would contain um, at this point you know, one or two gigabytes of VRAM. Um, so also, interestingly enough, I don't think this one, oh yes, I guess it does, um, has a graphic processor unit, which is a GPU is what those are called. And that's similar to a CPU, except that it exclusively renders graphic data. Uh, so a GPU will actually be many, 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 many times faster than a CPU. Um, so for that reason, I told you about password cracking programs becoming more and more and more effective. Those very, very savvy uh, hackers are beginning to use GPUs um, in their brute force password cracking uh, attacks because they are so much faster and for, so, for parsing um, dumb repetitive processes over and over again like trying different uh, combinations in a password, um, GPUs are much, much, much more effective for the job. And so that's why passwords are becoming one of the reasons passwords are becoming less and less and less effective. So GPUs are ridiculously wicked, wicked fast, because they can be. They don't have nearly as much thinking to do. Okay, mixed output, sound, voice, and video. Sound output produces digitized sound and even 3D sound, depending on how good your system is at home. You do need a sound card and sound software in that uh, the zeros and ones are transformed into analog sound to get into your analog speakers. Uh, voice output converts digital data into speech-like sounds. Um, it used to be pretty, pretty, pretty wonky uh, in the old video games when they would try to include um, voices. Uh, they just didn't really sound quite right. But now that's, that's a thing of the past. Um, computers can very, 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 very effectively recreate human voices. And uh, video output, which as you may or may not know, uh, is a series of photographic images played quickly enough to appear as full motion. Uh, so in film, that effect is created by 24 slides of film per second is enough to trick your eyes into thinking that you're seeing a moving image where in fact you're only seeing 24 frames of film flying by uh, in one second. And the magic number for video is 30 frames per second. So on television, you're not actually seeing um, uh, a continuous stream, you're actually seeing 30 individual frames per, per second. The future of output. Uh, you can expect to have more unusual forms of output. More data used uh, in big data is another uh, creepy concept to me, but maybe I'm just easily creeped out. Uh, and more realistic output, uh, the one that um, I find most interesting is Google Glass. Uh, maybe you've seen and maybe you've heard about the uh, glasses that are output devices and I suppose input devices in that they can take pictures. Um, but so you actually wear them and on one of your eyes, I forget which one, uh, it displays the output of your computer monitor or the computer monitor so that um, if you, I, I don't know, if you wink, it takes a picture uh, and then you can surf the net using your Google Glasses and stuff like that. We can expect that that trend will definitely, 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 definitely continue. I mean, how many of you can say, I mean, kids walk around these days, ooh, I got my smartphone glued to my face. You know, we can definitely, definitely, people seem to like that instant gratification of connecting to the internet at any time, anywhere. We seem to be starting to take that almost for granted in our daily lives. So you can expect that tech, or, um, technologies like Google Glass, will, they'll be around. We'll be seeing a lot more of that stuff. In fact, I have little to no doubt that the average 21-year-old would have no problem embedding an entire computer inside of their body if it meant that they could ac access Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, uh, anywhere, anytime. You know, I have absolutely no doubt. Uh, so that we can expect that sort of thing to continue to become more and more and more per pervasive. Oh, uh, and 3D output. Uh, so um, well, I, uh, virtual reality is the example I was thinking of. But uh, there was, so there was recently 
a technology that came out called Oculus Rift, which was um, an extremely immersive um, virtual uh, reality interface that was created for gaming originally. Uh, and it was very, very, very exciting. I mean, it was supposed to be extremely realistic, and so the gamers were very, very excited about this new Oculus Rift technology. Uh, and then Facebook swooped in and bought it. So the people who created this extremely exciting virtual reality um, hardware and software uh, sold out. And so they're good for the rest of their lives, believe me. Um, whatever his name is, uh, Winklevoss or... Um, uh, what's that guy say? Who cares? Um, so Facebook swooped in and bought that technology, and we're not exactly sure now. Uh, it hasn't been implemented or, or put into effect yet, but we can bet that Facebook is scheming up some sort of virtual um, experience for us all to enjoy sometime, or they wouldn't have paid for it. Okay, let's talk briefly about health matters. Um, I'm sure like you, young bucks, who think that you're young and invincible and nothing could ever hurt you. I used to think that too, until I started to develop carpal tunnel from being a slack, lazy typer. Uh, so I will jump on the bandwagon and say, you should be careful when you're typing. Make sure that there's a little bit of space between your wrists and the keyboard. You don't want to be Mr. Lazy Typer like this because carpal tunnel hurts. It sucks. You don't want to get it. So I have just very, 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 very minor. Uh, I have to be very careful. I can't focus on my, um, my typing now because it really is painful. So I really, I wouldn't wish this fate on anybody. So please be very, very careful. Consider how you type because you definitely do not want to get repetitive stress carpal tunnel. You don't want it. Believe me. Please be careful how you type. Be careful out there, kids. So carpal tunnel is the main one, but perhaps in this day and age, perhaps you've experienced eye strain or a migraine associated with squinting at a computer screen all day, like so many of us do. That one's no fun either, kids, and it's getting to the point where our jobs constitute scaring at, staring at screens all day long. And then those, those kids go home and continue to stare at their little screens, you know, and how many of us go home and then stare at our big screens, whatever it may be. So uh, staring at screens isn't always good. Get back to nature every once in a while. Go outside of the house. But as it says here, eye strains, headaches, back and neck pains associated with staring at screens can be painful. And then finally, ergonomics is the, uh, the science, the methodology of designing a workplace in which conditions and equipment are safer and more conducive to keeping you healthy and free from repetitive stress and eye strain and the like. Okay, my friends, that concludes this lecture on input and output devices. I can't tell you how much of a pleasure it has been being with you here today and discoursing on these subjects. And I very, very, very much look forward to the next installment of GIT 335.